Our next case, our next presentation is by Brian Walker. He goes to the McGovern Medical School, which is formerly known as the University of Texas of Houston, uh, which is where I went to medical school. And uh, he's going to talk to us about changes in keratometry and refraction and small aperture corneal inlay implantation. Um, yeah, so I'm Brian Walker, but I also want to give a shout out to everyone else that I worked with on this project, especially uh, Dr. Moshfar. Uh, to quote a current MBA great, he's the real MVP um, in, in doing this research. But um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about changing the keratometry and refraction after a camera, small aperture corneal inlay implantation. And some of the people on this, not me at all, have ties with the actual maker of the camera inlay for you to see right there. So the, many of you probably already know this, but the camera small aperture corneal inlay is a little disc uh, made of polyvinylene fluoride that's used for the treatment of presbyopia. So it's stuck in the non-dominant um, eye in an intrastromal pocket in the cornea. As you can see, those are the dimensions. Um, and it increases depth of focus by using principles of pinhole optics. And the makers of this suggest that it's placed um, in a pocket created a depth of 200 to 250 microns uh, made by feptosecond laser. So there's kind of a picture showing theoretically how the light passes through to help you focus at, at near to see better. So the indications um, that we kind of used for um, our study and evaluating people that got this was the same as the indications that the, this company gives as, um, and the FDA as well that approved this for presbyopia that is placed in a non-dominant um, fake eye for people between 45 to 60 with um, those spherical equivalents as well as less than 0.75 diopter of sill and that require add for reading between um, 1 to 2.5. Um, so just looking at the data from the FDA trial, the pivotal study, 84% of patients had a UNVA or uncorrected near visual acuity of 24 year better by 12 months which their threshold to approve it, I believe, was 75%, so that did well. However, looking closer, uh, one large thing that was noticed was 8.9% of the inlays were removed, and 87 were due to visual complaints. Hyperoptic shift being the most um, common thing, as well as other things, myopic shift or inadequate visual benefit, or just um, induced cylinder as well. So in our study, we evaluated 50 patients who received this inlay um, up to three years postoperatively, looking at near visual acuity, distance visual acuity, spherical equivalent, um, mean keratometry, the steep and uh, flat as well, and corneal topography, as well as surgically induced astigmatism, which is um, using the Alpins vector method, taking the difference between uh, the steepest and flattest um, reading along the axis of the steepest um, part on the cornea. So <coughs> similar to many other studies that have been done previously on the camera, we had patients, most of them did very well at three years in terms of their visual acuity. 86% of patients had um, near visual acuity of 2032 or better and 88 had distance of 2025 or better at three years. So. Overall, it seems that the camera, um, as shown in previous studies, did very well. The interesting thing um, that we found that really hadn't been previously reported that there was a large increase in mean keratometry at all subsequent post-operative months, as you can see here. Um, and that up to two years post-operatively, um, average um, throughout all of our patients, there was a hyperopic shift that was noted up to 24 months. It was statistically significant at two years and then decreased slightly out to three years. So this is just um, to overlay the two. So at the very start, we saw uh, an increase in keratometry with a myopic shift as we kind of expected postoperatively. But subsequently, there was uh, a pretty constant hyperopic shift in this subset of patients. Um, with an increased keratometry still. And these are just the actual numbers from those graphs. Um, and another thing we found when, when looking at patients that had this hyperopic shift was that many of them had a 
specific pattern of steepening um, on corneal topography. So for example, in patient number three, you can see it really well that they're pretty, pretty even around the annulus or of the, of the body of the inlay to begin. But as time went on, you can see that there's this nice steepening right over the body of the inlay with relative central flattening over the visual axis of the cornea. And that's what it looks like is causing this hyperopic shift in a lot of the patients. So just to give you an example of a patient over time, um, we can see kind of, it's not as good of a picture, but he also had this ring-like pattern of steepening with a hyperopic shift. And as time went on, you can see the ring disappeared, and, and so did the hyperopic shift in his vision. Um, interestingly as well, two of the patients in this study out of the 50 had an inverse pattern of steepening um, here on the left side with the myopic shift. So there was actually f um, flattening over that body of the inlay with steepening centrally over the visual axis. Um, but the majority of the patients had this on the left side with the steepening over the inlay. Uh, and lastly, we also looked um, to see if the, the inlay or the surgery was surgically um, inducing any astigmatism, and we didn't find anything statistically significant. You can see here's the pre-ops here on the top of the average astigmatism of the left and right eyes, and it didn't change too much. This red line is the summated mean for all of the patients. Um, so just looking into the, into the data of what we found, obviously there's an alteration of satisfaction for some of the patients that have this hyperopic or myopic shift that, that may not like the inlay and may want it, for example, to be removed. Uh, another implication that we thought that um, where it could be um, important was in cataract surgery. We noticed that for some of the patients with the, with the steepening being annular and not centrally in the visual axis, the tomographer reported mean keratometry was about a diopter more than the actual, if you were to look at it uh, on the corneal topography. However, looking at case reports of of cataract surgeries that had been done in people after implantation. Um, they had successful outcomes using postoperative biometry measurements and the SRK, SRKT Iowa calculation formula. Um, and as well, like I previously mentioned, some people might need PRK or want removal of it due to the shifts in interfractive outcomes after implantation. Uh, so one of the other things that, that we started thinking about uh, is that the wound healing um, kind of reaction that happens after implantation of this foreign material is greater as the, the less shallow you place it. So for example, when they first started implanting these, it was around 150 to 170 microns, just under a little flap, and they've been going deeper and deeper. And the reason for that is because they think that, I mean, it's been shown that keratocyte populations are denser in the anterior stroma, so the deeper you go, the, the the less you're messing with the keratocytes, for lack of better terms. Um, so actually, the, um, and the less wound healing reaction you're going to get with that steepening. So recently, after, after um, this study, they've started implanting the, the inlays at a slightly deeper depth in the pocket, all the way up to 300 microns, and this is all they don't have a ton of patients yet, but as you can see from this data, the pocket depth greater than 200, they, they did 200, less than 250 and greater than 250, but most of these are around 300. You can see that there's a, been a less of a shift in refraction compared to the less than 250 group, as well as slightly better outcomes in vision. The numbers aren't very big. You can see right here, less than 250, we have 52 people and greater than we have 27 people right now. Um, but it is interesting going forward to see if, um, if that will help kind of alleviate some of these shifts that, that patients are having with this inlay implantation. Thank you for your time. Questions, comments?